Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, a couple of months ago, I crunched the numbers on whether a sufficiently athletic astronaut could throw a ball back to Earth from the space station. And while I compared the speed of the projectiles to the retrograde velocity required for deorbiting a spacecraft, many, many people couldn't see a problem. The natural way people think about it is that in zero g, in the absence of drag and with the force of Earth's gravity, any object propelled straight down towards Earth would have nothing to stop it and would quickly reach the Earth's atmosphere and deorbit. And it's a fine example of how orbital mechanics can defy our normal expectations of motion. So let's do a demo in the Kerbal Space Program. If I did actually project an object straight down from this space station, then indeed it would initially appear to move down towards the planet below. But as time went on, it would start to move laterally. It would actually start to move ahead of the space station in its orbit. And about one quarter of a way around the orbit, the object would stop getting lower towards the planet. And it would actually start rising again. And in about a half orbit later, it would actually be once again at the same altitude as the space station, although it would be ahead of us. Fast forward this more, it actually rises up above the space station and a full orbit later, if you've thrown it just right, it could actually come back and hit you. I think one of the things that really confuses people is that there's actually two coordinate frames. The space station keeps a constant orientation relative to the Earth. It always has the same down and the space station has to keep this orientation by rotating slowly as it moves around the Earth. Now, as soon as you throw the ball, it actually is no longer being controlled by this rotation. So its initial velocity vector carrying it away from the space station doesn't rotate with the space station. So that means about 23 minutes later, as the space station has moved one quarter of a way around its orbit, guess what? It's now going sideways. It's actually going along the, the space station's orbit and actually going slightly faster. So it then starts to rise up. And of course, 45 minutes later, halfway around the orbit, the velocity vector is pointing straight out and bringing it across the space station in the opposite direction. And if we follow that for even longer, it will again slow down and start coming back down. What's happened is that the orbit has become slightly elliptic and instead of the object orbiting at the same altitude, it now oscillates between a low point and a high point, or as astronomers and Kerbal Space Program players say, perigee and apogee. And it's entirely possible to drop the perigee far enough that it ends up inside the atmosphere, but it has to do that inside this first quarter orbit before it starts going up. And turns out that if you do the math, it, you need about four times as much velocity to do this compared to just throwing it out backwards. When you're in orbit, you're already moving around the Earth at about seven and a half kilometers per second. So if you throw an object away, you're changing the total velocity. It's not a simple arithmetic addition, it's a vector addition. So when you throw a ball downwards, that's at 90 degrees to that seven and a half kilometer per second velocity. So if you throw it down at like 100 meters per second, you do the math, it turns out that you only change the total magnitude of the velocity by about two thirds of a meter per second. And because the velocity is practically unchanged and the altitude is practically unchanged, the energy of the orbit really doesn't change by very much. So it's a very inefficient way of changing your orbital energy. If you want to go up or down, you want to maximize the change to your velocity magnitude. So you want to project the object either forwards to increase the energy or backwards to decrease the energy. And this explains why most maneuvers performed in Kerbal Space Program are either prograde or retrograde burns to adjust the size of the orbit. Now that's for dropping an object back from low Earth orbit, where the radius of the orbit is very close to the radius of the planet. But what about dropping something, say, from the Earth into the Sun? Say some of that radioactive waste that people talk about throwing into the Sun. Well, the Sun may be huge, but its radius is actually really small relative to the radius of Earth's orbit. So dropping an object into the Sun requires a much bigger kick. And we know now that applying that kick retrograde is the most efficient way to drop your perihelion down. Except, 
When you want to get more than about 40% of the way to the sun, at that point, the most efficient way to fire your engines literally turns around and it's better to accelerate forwards, increasing your orbital velocity, lifting your spacecraft higher and higher. And as you coast outwards, your velocity drops. And as your velocity drops, it gets very, very small. And from there, it only takes a very small kick to drop your perihelion down into the sun. Now the crossover point actually co uh, corresponds to the escape velocity. This is a critical point where a spacecraft has enough energy to escape the gravity of the central body it's orbiting. Of course, this has the downside of taking significantly more time to reach your goal because you have to go a long way out before your velocity drops sufficiently uh, and no real spacecraft would ever use this trick because it's possible to plan gravity assists from other planets. For example, the Parker Solar Probe is going to launch this year and it's going to get closer to the sun than anything else. But it is going to do this using gravity assists from Venus. For another example of orbits being back to front, let's talk about constellations of CubeSats. The Dove satellites are basically Earth observation CubeSats. They are fit into a 3U form factor, which means they are 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by about 30 centimeter. They're about that size, right? They're tiny. They're built around a, a camera with a 100 millimeter lens and they're, they're Earth observation satellites. Now, several of them get launched at the same time on the same spacecraft. So they will all end up at roughly the same point in the same orbit a little clump of them floating in space, but to make them useful, they want to spread these things out along the orbit so that they can more evenly cover the Earth. The spacecraft are small, so they don't have rocket engines, but they do have something called magnetorkers that they can use to control their attitude relative to the Earth. They also have solar panels that are used to provide power and can be used to apply drag. So it seems easy enough. If two spacecraft want to separate, then one of them goes into a low drag configuration, turning its solar panels edge on to the Earth's atmosphere. The other goes into a high drag configuration, trying to grab as much atmosphere and slowing it down more so that it falls behind its low drag faster twin. And this sounds very convincing, but it's not true. The bizarre thing is that that spacecraft with the high drag configuration that is attempting best to slow down, in fact, speeds up. Because as it catches the Earth's atmosphere, what that does is it slows it down a little initially, but that means that its orbit drops. And as its orbit drops, that means that it has to move faster because it's in a lower orbit. So paradoxically, the ones that are designed to be super streamlined end up going slower than the ones that are designed to experience as much drag as possible. So paradoxically, yeah, if you want to go faster in orbit, you have to hit the brakes. If you want to go slower in an orbit, you need to accelerate. So if you are in a spacecraft and you're looking out for the space station and it's behind you, you want to fire your thrusters to take you away from the space station. And similarly, if you're behind the space station, you want to fire your thrusters to um, you know, slow yourself down a little so that you fall down and catch up on the space station. <laughs> like, yes, this is kind of crazy. And don't be sad if you find this really hard to follow because even astronauts have been confused by this particular aspect of orbital mechanics. On Gemini 4, crewed by James McDivitt and Ed White, their main mission plan was to perform the first spacewalk by a US astronaut. But late in the planning, it was decided that they would attempt orbital rendezvous with the Titan rocket's upper stage. Now, because the rendezvous was a late addition to the schedule, there wasn't really any special training added to prepare the crew for the ideal maneuvers. And having achieved orbit, the pilot turned the spacecraft around and began to accelerate towards the target to bring them closer together. And as you can imagine, it, this didn't work. As time went on, they didn't really seem to get any closer. And the more and more maneuvers were attempted to correct this. But the crew, two of the US's best pilots, were unable to close the distance. And eventually, they abandoned the attempt after using about half the spacecraft's maneuvering fuel. But I'm going to say, to be fair to the crew of Gemini 4, situation wasn't ideal. The booster wasn't a perfect target because 
it would still be venting fuel and gases at this time, which was probably changing its orbit. Also, at this point in the Gemini program, they didn't have a rendezvous radar, so they had a hard time estimating the distance to the target. Um, but I'm going to also point out that Gemini 12... Its radar changed and uh, the crew was able to navigate in using a sextant and paper. But I will also mention that the navigator, the co-pilot on that was none other than Buzz Aldrin, who literally wrote the book on Orbital Rendezvous. I mean, literally, that was his PhD thesis. And I guess that's my whole point here is that sometimes I will say things and do things and it doesn't make sense until you really think about it a little more. So I hope you've learned a little here. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.